When the first Jurassic Park movie came out, it was a huge deal. And three decades later, it's clear Universal Studios has spared no expense investing in the franchise. We have come a long way since watching scientists get elbow deep in dino dung, and it's time to take a look back at how the series has progressed over the years. Yes, we're going to take you back to the past with a look at the Jurassic Park timeline. From the glory of Jeff Goldblum to Chris Pratt commanding a pack of raptors, it's been a long, strange, dino-filled journey. Universal Pictures was so set on bringing Jurassic Park to the big screen that they bought the movie rights before Michael Crichton even had a chance to publish the first book. Yes, there are a series of Jurassic Park novels, and while they are so worth a read, we are going to be focusing on the cinematic side of the franchise. And you know what that means. We're going back to the beginning with the very first Jurassic Park from 1993. In 1525, Spanish navigator Diego Fernandez discovered an island known as Isla Nublar, later called Cloud Island by Nicolas de Huelva. A few quick centuries later, wealthy businessman John Hammond purchased Isla Nublar and used it to create a theme park called Jurassic Park. Hey, that's the name of the movie! Although he spared no expense on the snazzy painted jeeps and mouth-watering food spread, he did apparently skimp a little bit on the background checks for his employees. He'd learned the ins and outs of the park business by helping to run a park called Animal Kingdom in Kenya, but he and his company InGen weren't quite ready to scale up from mammals to dinosaurs. His original idea was to build a park in San Diego, but he decided maybe it would be safer to unleash ancient lizards a little bit farther away from large populations of human beings. Hammond was able to fill his park with living, breathing dinosaurs thanks to extracting DNA stored inside mosquitoes encased in ancient amber. Sure, there were a few missing genomes here and there, but nothing a little bit of frog DNA couldn't fix. Scientists genetically engineered all of the dinos to be female in order to carefully control their breeding. But in the immortal words of Jeff Goldblum, life finds a way. Hammond decided to invite a group of professionals to his park to check out the place before the grand opening. These included paleontologist Dr. Alan Grant, paleobotanist Dr. Ellie Sattler, and mathematician Dr. Ian Malcolm. You probably don't need to be a master mathematician to see that dinosaurs plus humans equals disaster. Hammond also invited his two grandkids, presumably because he wanted to make their other grandparents look lame for not having a park filled with dinosaurs. All this would have been fine and dandy if not for Newman, uh, I mean computer programmer Dennis Nedry. Nedry decided to steal some dinosaur embryos and flip them for some fast cash to a rival corporation. Thanks to the perfect storm of Nedry's treachery and, well, an actual storm, the park's failsafes start to fail and dinosaurs start running amok. Seriously, Phil, you had one job. The kitchen was soon filled with velociraptors, the bathroom was invaded by an angry T-Rex, and Hammond's grandkids definitely wished they'd hung out with their grandparents who don't own a dinosaur-filled theme park. Even Nedry doesn't manage to escape a messy end after getting too close to one of these creatures. Ultimately, all the survivors unanimously decide not to endorse Jurassic Park mostly because of the aforementioned rampaging dinosaurs. Everyone who wasn't messily devoured left the island via helicopter to escape to the safety of the mainland. It turns out that all the money in the world doesn't make resurrecting ancient beasts a good idea. I don't want to spoil anything for you, but that's not a lesson most of the people in this universe ever learn. Before we move on to the next film in the franchise, it's worth mentioning Jurassic Park the game. There are a few different video games in the franchise, but this one involves a group of survivors during and after the events of the first Jurassic Park movie, so it's worth mentioning in the context of the timeline. But let's move on to the next feature-length film. Up next, we have The Lost World Jurassic Park, which was uh, loosely based on Crichton's novel The Lost World. It takes place four years after the previous film, and apparently the whole dinosaur rampage really mucked things up for Hammond and the InGen company overall. 
There had been talk of blowing up the old Jurassic Park, but the US Army apparently never got around to it. There was a second island, originally in Jen's factory floor so to speak, where they cloned and raised the dinosaurs, but thanks to some natural disasters, Site B just ended up with a bunch of wild dinos. At least the dinosaurs were confined to an island, which would have been helpful if humans had managed to stay away. Things definitely don't get any better when there was an attack by a pack of Compsognathus on a hapless yacht passenger who had the bad luck of landing on Site B, Isla Sorna. By this point, InGen was being run by Hammond's nephew, Peter Ludlow, and not everyone was convinced he was the best at his job. Dr. Ian Malcolm was still pretty upset about what he went through in the first movie, but decided to help InGen document the dinosaurs of Isla Sorna since his girlfriend Dr. Sarah Harding had already gone ahead to the island. Love and dinosaurs are both excellent motivators, and on his journey, Ian discovered that his daughter Kelly stowed away on their mobile base, just to make the stakes a little bit higher. Surely she'll have a much better time than those other kids who tagged along on a dinosaur adventure. Apparently Ludlow didn't learn a single thing from the events of the previous movie, because his plan all along was to round up the dinos and transport them to a theme park in San Diego. Hammond's last plan hadn't failed spectacularly enough, so he was was going to resurrect his idea for a Jurassic Park San Diego. The group released some captured dinosaurs, but instead of being grateful for their freedom, they started going wild on the camp. They got up close and personal with a baby T-Rex, but that was a lot less fun when its parents came looking for it. Malcolm and Harding tried their best to convince Ludlow that his plan was more lethal than lucrative, but they didn't have much success. When a ship carrying a male T-Rex crashed, this really helped drive home their point, especially since it started running amok in the city. But unlike his uncle, Ludlow is apparently a slow learner because he didn't see the problem until he was devoured by a father and son T-Rex team. Both dinosaurs were shipped back to Isla Sorna and the American and Costa Rican governments declared the area a natural preserve. That's a funny way of saying crawling with dangerous giant lizards, but whatever works. The government passed the Ethical Negligence Within Paleogenetic Resurrection Bill, which basically makes Hammond's life work very, very illegal. He sadly passed away, probably due to the lack of dinosaurs he was experiencing. After that, Simon Mazrani bought out InGen to create Jurassic World and almost immediately started performing experiments that showed he learned nothing from the first two movies. Uh, before we get too involved in the machinations of Simon Mazrani and the dino disasters to come, let's take a look at Jurassic Park 3. This movie represents another four year time skip, bringing us to the year 2001 on the lovely Isla Sorna. Well, lovely except for all the dinosaurs that are very, very much still alive. Dr. Alan Grant is back in the mix from the first movie, and apparently he's still very much into studying dinosaurs, albeit from a respectable distance this time. He was trying to fund his study about the intelligence of velociraptors, but found it difficult to find investors. Apparently narrowly escaping an island filled with prehistoric creatures doesn't get you any grant money. He has some lofty ideas about these dinos, including that if they hadn't gone extinct, they would have become the dominant species on Earth instead of humans. So basically it sounds like he was picturing the infamously terrible Mario Brothers movie complete with raptor head Goombas. Anyway, Paul and Amanda Kirby posed as a wealthy couple interested in funding his research, but in reality they just wanted Dr. Grant's help to rescue their son who went missing on Isla Sorna as well as Amanda's boyfriend who they also managed to lose track of. Dr. Grant may have had some strange ideas about dinosaurs, but he was slightly less eager to meet his own end than apparently everyone else in the franchise. He reluctantly agreed to give them an aerial tour in exchange for some of that sweet, sweet research money. But instead, he found himself once more on dino-covered ground. He discovered the truth about the Kirbys, and they learned that he didn't know anything more about this particular island than they did. Apparently, they managed to get the only two islands with dinosaurs on them mixed up, but that was really the least of their problems. Unsurprisingly, the group was attacked by hostile dinosaurs, and at one point, they made the horrible decision to take some raptor eggs. Definitely no chance anyone would come looking for those. Needless to say, this only made matters worse, but eventually the survivors managed to make it off the island. They realized that dinosaurs were being bred illegally there, but this information was covered up by a series of bribes. A year later, Simon founded Timac Construction with the intent of creating Jurassic World and got started building the park. There's a trilogy of spin-off novels written by Scott Seeson and based on this movie. The Jurassic Park Adventure series 
series includes Survivor, Prey, and Flyers. You know, just in case you're interested in reading along. After the third movie, fans had to wait over a decade for Jurassic World, which was released in 2015. This was the fourth film in the overall franchise, but the first installment of the Jurassic World trilogy. Simon Mazrani had been very busy with the construction of the latest dinosaur park and was at least smart enough to make security a big line item in the company budget. Needless to say, he also had to spend a lot of time placating conservationists and regular people who just didn't think bringing dinosaurs back to life was a good idea. But with enough money, the laws about creating dinosaurs began to change, which meant Masrani could start churning out new and even more dangerous dinosaurs than ever before. He did this under the guise of medical advancement, which allowed him to get around the anti-dinosaur legislation. The fact that he built the park right on top of the bones of the original Jurassic Park on Isla Nublar was just the cherry on top of this terrible idea Sunday. In 2004, Claire Deering started interning at Jurassic World, and there's actually a novel about her time in this position. It's called The Evolution of Claire by Tess Sharp, and even though it was released at the same time as Fallen Kingdom, which we'll get to in a little bit, it predates the events of Jurassic World. The new park was completed in 2005, and dinosaurs were transferred from Isla Sorna back to Isla Nublar. The new park opened up, and Claire took on a full-time position. For a while, things go really well. And by that, I mean it's a little while before someone else gets devoured by a dinosaur. But for a time, visitors Visitors flock to the new Jurassic World, and all the money-changing hands makes it seem as though nothing could possibly go wrong. Until the team decides to make an even bigger, badder dinosaur than ever before. Speaking of getting eaten by dinosaurs, in 2015 we have the events of the Jurassic World movie. Claire's nephews, Zack and Gray Mitchell, come to visit the park on a leisurely our parents are getting a divorce vacation. Working at the park is ethologist Owen Grady, who is training a herd of velociraptors. Remember, it's not a Jurassic Park movie unless they really hammer home the fact that these raptors were quite intelligent for a big bunch of lizards. I can open a doorknob too, raptors. <clears throat> Geneticist Dr. Henry Wu had created a dinosaur called the Indominus Rex, which was even more dangerous than a T-Rex as in could turn pretty much invisible and mask its heat signature dangerous. Seriously, you can probably guess what happens from there, but I'll fill you in anyway. Owen declared the aggressive and unpredictable dino too dangerous to live, but Simon didn't want to take a bullet to his profits. So when the dinosaur tricked some park workers and escaped, employees used non-lethal means to subdue it. Well, the methods were non-lethal for the Indominus. A lot of humans didn't survive the attempt to capture the dinosaur, and things only spiraled spiraled more out of control from there. Eventually, Owen used the raptors to track the Indominus, but then the rogue dino took over as the raptors' leader since they shared DNA. That's the kind of thing that just plain hurts emotionally, and physically since dinosaurs are involved. He managed to win back his few surviving raptors, and with the help of a good old-fashioned T-Rex, they took down the Indominus and allowed the survivors to escape the park. Oh, and this all inspired the kids' parents not to get a divorce after all! I'm not sure why. I know a lot more about Jurassic Park movies than romance, so you'll have to figure that out on your own. Jurassic World Camp Cretaceous is a CGI animated series coming to Netflix in 2020. Both Netflix and DreamWorks Animation are collaborating on the project, and it will take place during the same time period as Jurassic World. It's about six teens going to an adventure camp on Isla Nublar, and to be fair, dealing with escaped dinosaurs is pretty adventurous. The series will follow the cast as they attempt to get off the island and presumably try to get their camp deposits back. Shortly after the first Jurassic World movie ended, a mercenary team was sent out to retrieve DNA samples from the remains of the Indominus Rex. Yes, you and I know this couldn't possibly lead to anything good, but common sense is in shorter supply than dinosaurs in this franchise. As if the island wasn't already dangerous enough, it's discovered that the volcano Mount Saibo is still active. In 2018, the US Senate had a hearing to decide if the dinosaurs on Isla Nublar should be saved from the impending volcanic eruption, or nah. I know life uh, finds a way in everything, but these dinosaurs are incredibly dangerous, and they already went extinct once, so is it really a big deal if they do it again? Okay, maybe I'm a monster, but Dr. Ian Malcolm agreed with me. He believed Hammond should have never brought them back to life in the first place, and simply by doing nothing, humans could make things right. 
Personally, I love doing nothing, but Claire Deering disagrees. She started up the Dinosaur Protection Group with the intention of saving them. Unsurprisingly, the Senate voted against rescuing giant human-eating monsters, but that didn't deter Deering. She linked up with Hammond's former partner Benjamin Lockwood, who wanted to relocate them to a new island and recruits Owen Grady to help her out. Claire and her allies decided to utilize the old dinosaur tracking system to help them hunt down the raptor Blue and other dinosaurs. But it turned out not not everyone was on the same page, since mercenary leader Ken Wheatley ended up tranquilizing Grady after Blue was wounded. The mercenaries loaded up their ship with dinosaurs and left the rest to meet their fiery, lava-filled ends. It turns out that the mercenaries' plan the whole time was to sell these dinosaurs on the black market because yes, in this universe, black market dinosaurs exist. Lockwood was furious, but he was taken out. And we learned that the new big bad dinosaur in town was the Indoraptor. Part Indominus Rex, part Velociraptor, all dangerous. Eventually, the Indoraptor was defeated and the other dinosaurs were, well, saved, I guess. Even though they escaped into the wilderness, where they posed an enormous threat to any humans they come across, not to mention the ecosystem, Dr. Malcolm declared this the beginning of a Neo-Jurassic Age where humans and dinosaurs learn to coexist, even though there are now many movies showing why that is a terrible idea. Battle at the Big Rock isn't a feature-length movie, but it still takes place within the Jurassic Park universe, so it's definitely worth a mention. This short film takes place a year after Fallen Kingdom and tells the story of a wholesome family camping trip that happens to take place in an area of California teeming with loose dinosaurs. Said family finds themselves trapped in an RV with an Allosaurus raging outside. But after the dinosaur has a quick chat with a crossbow, it decides to find an easier target. Hey, what do you want from me? This movie's only like eight minutes long. Okay, now we are all up to date on the Jurassic Park timeline, but there is still more story to be told. The sixth film overall and third Jurassic World movie, Dominion, will be released in 2021. Filming kicked off in February of 2020, and old school fans will be excited to see three classic characters returning to the big screen. Laura Dern's Dr. Ellie Sattler will be reuniting with Dr. Alan Grant and Dr. Ian Malcolm in Dominion. Apparently, these poor characters just haven't been through enough dinosaur-related catastrophes. We'll also see many characters from the Jurassic World franchise, including Claire Deering and Owen Grady. Currently, we don't know very much about the film, but if I had to hazard a guess, I would predict, uh, rampaging dinosaurs, morally dubious experiments with dino DNA, and at least one character with more money than common sense. One thing is for certain, and that is the fact that I will definitely be seeing this movie when it hits theaters. So which one of these Jurassic Park movies is your favorite? Are you looking forward to Dominion, or do you think the franchise has already jumped the Megalodon? Let us know what you think in the comment section below, and don't forget to click on the subscribe button for more videos from us here at CBR. We'll see you again next time.